I'm Cliff Lynch. Let me welcome you to the uh, fall 2015 CNI member meeting. Um, I am delighted to see so many people here. Um, uh, we have really good representation from our member organizations. We have um, a number of guests that I'm delighted were able to join us. And um, we have a very, very uh, rich program for you today. Um, I'd like to start by just taking care of a few housekeeping things. Um, so far, uh, everything is happening on schedule, although I have heard some sporadic uh, reports of delays into national earlier today, um, and uh, we will adapt to those as best we can. There is a message board right by the registration table, which has, um, w and will post any schedule changes there. As of right now, um, there are no schedule changes. There are, I understand, one or two um, speaker changes at a couple of sessions, but everything's going to go on as scheduled. If, that, if anything changes, check the board there. Um, we've also put a list on that message board of the, um, of the sessions that we plan to capture. Um, uh, on uh, video or voiceover presentation. Um, a number of people have uh, asked us to make that available um, to help them uh, sort through which sessions they're going to um, uh, attend. So that, that is up there for uh, folks who want to consult it. Um, I do need to make the caveat that um, you never know that the you never know whether the recording's going to work until you listen to it. Um, so that's, the, that's a statement of our best intentions, not a promise. Um, I'd like to welcome some um, new members and a rejoining member. Um, we have several new members. Um, these include the uh, U.S. Military Academy Libraries, Dalhousie University Libraries, the College of William and Mary, DePaul University, and the University of Rhode Island. Rejoining CNI, we also have um, uh, back the uh, Library of Virginia. And please welcome uh, those institutions and their representatives. Um, I also just want to take a very brief minute to recognize a couple of folks who are in new leadership roles. Um, I'm always a little hesitant to do this because there are always more people who just didn't get on the list for one reason or another because um, uh, I haven't seen them or um, uh, didn't think of it or was just being stupid or something. But um, I would just like to uh, recognize a couple of people who I think are in the audience and just I'll just ask them to stand up for a second wave when I mention them. Um, we have with us the new um, executive director of LIDA, Jenny Levine, um, who I hope is here somewhere. Yes, welcome. Um, we have um, with us, I believe, although I haven't actually seen him, I hope he's here, um, Robert Miller, the new, um, ex the new uh, CEO of Lyricis. There he is. Welcome. And I'd also like to recognize um, uh, Mary Molinero, the uh, new chief operating officer working with uh, Steve Morales at uh, DPN. Welcome. Um, I also would like to just in this vein um, bring greetings from someone who couldn't be here to be recognized today but hopefully will join us in San Antonio and that is the new CEO of Educause, um, John O'Brien. Uh, I've had a number of opportunities to chat with him uh, since he took his position and um, uh, I know he is excited about um, the role that CNI can play collaborating with uh, EDGECAUSE going forward. Um, so I uh, hope to be able to broker that introduction in the spring, but he did ask me to send his best and say he was sorry he could not be here. And with that, I think all of my um, introductions and things are done, and that um, takes us into uh, 
the kind of uh, year in review and preview. And um, I know uh, you found the um, uh, CNI program plans for 1516 in your uh, agenda book. I will mention a number of things that are in there, but not all of them, because um, uh, I don't think time will permit. Um, I'm happy to uh, field questions on, uh, on those either in the Q&A at the end or later. Uh, but I want to I want to kind of um, take a broad look around and put some of the work we're doing in context. Uh, and you know, I have to say, I found myself as I was um, uh, pulling together this talk um, in a very strange place. Um, I feel like we are in a time when there's a lot of transition happening. Um, organizational transitioning, policy transitioning. Um, we are seeing, at least from where I sit, the kind of um, character of innovation that's affecting our community shifting a bit. Um, there are things going on at the fundamental technology and that will take a while to play out into real things. Um, at the kind of consumer market um, and there's um, in some ways not very much innovation happening but a lot um, in peripheral areas that's about to happen and I'll go into more of this later. Um, but we're seeing major shifts in the way people are thinking about scale and about interconnecting things and um, I think those are very important developments that will play through. <clears throat> I want to start though with some discussion of public access in part because this is an issue that's very much on my mind in part also because it's clearly an issue that's on the minds of many people here. We did an executive roundtable, as many of you know, um, this morning, dealing with funder mandates com and compliance and related issues. And uh, actually, we're inundated by requests to participate in this to the extent where we put on a second session yesterday afternoon and still found it necessary to turn people away because we didn't have room. Um, and um, those discussions uh, um, have been quite illuminating. Uh, where we are, you know, is we've had a long discussion in this country, and it's worth noting that um, there are a number of uh, international colleagues, especially in various European um, nations, who are farther down the road than we are. But we've had, a, we, we've had a long kind of discussion about public access to publicly funded uh, research outputs that really has its roots in um, initiatives by the National Institutes of Health and then more systemically a February 2013 um, memo that came out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy on behalf of the White House that directed federal funding agencies to go and make provisions to ensure that um, both data and journal article publications coming out of federally funded research were publicly available. And then there was a very long delay. There was a long period of silence and wonder when these things are going to come out. And really, most of the key agency stuff did not come out until the first quarter of this year. And much of it came out in the first quarter of this year with implementation dates that were out in 2016 or beyond. Um, so they didn't take immediate effect. Um, there was some time for people to digest this. So it's really just now I would say that many of our institutions are coming to grips not so much with the you know sort of broad sentiment of public access to publicly funded research and um, you know, sort of broader initiatives around open data and open access, um, but the actual 
you know, practicalities and specifics of those um, funder requirements uh, for, um, con co for compliance to their specific roadmaps for making this material available. And this is very interesting because one of the things that is evident at this point is that there's a significant disconnect on the ground between what you need to do to ensure public access to published articles and what you and the sort of conversations that many of our institutions have been having with their faculty about open access and institutional open access mandates. Um, put another way, um, for some substantial funders, simply placing your material for public access in an institutional repository or putting it in an open access journal is not necessarily sufficient to conform to the, um, to the uh, funder requirements. There are things we can do about this. Um, obviously, one of the things that we need to get much more adroit at and to work with our, um, our colleagues at the funding agencies on is automatic propagation of articles from one place to the next so that um, if you deposit an article one place, it can be propagated out to wherever the various funding agencies want it. But, um, there's plenty to do here, and I think that one of the things we're going to face over the next um, couple of years is sorting out a lot of confusion from our scholars about what does it really mean to provide open access to research results, and how does that connect up to these funder mandates that they're starting to see. The fact that we have a wonderful assortment of funder mandates um, uh, from different funding sources um, is probably not going to make this conversation a lot simpler. Um, certainly, um, uh, we're already hearing reports of substantial confusion among um, uh, researchers about some of this. I think that some of what this underscores is the need for holistic institutional strategies, um, things that um, really carefully construct and um, try to be clear about the messages and the um, outreach that they're doing to faculty, to researchers. I think that um, we're seeing some very useful and helpful um, recognition that we shouldn't stovepipe articles over here and data over here that really this is about um, supporting the, the research community broadly in opening up access to this material. Um, but I think that um, we are clearly facing a number of challenges here um, that I would say really <coughs> were not evident as recently as a year ago. I think there's one other thing that we need to be a little careful about too, and that's overemphasis on compliance. One of the things that we saw starting probably four or five years ago was a serious commitment among many of our member institutions to work with scholars on research data management to provide the support that's needed for data and computationally intensive uh, scholarly work. And um, that really wasn't compliance driven. I mean, it was to an extent, but data management plans really aren't so much a compliance issue as they are a challenge and an invitation to um, researchers to think about the management of their data assets as they define a research program. And a lot of the support structure was not so much in merely writing data management plans, but helping faculty to think that through um, and to give them services to build upon where appropriate. So um, 
I think that we want to be mindful of the reasons we're doing these things and that they really are not just about compliance. Um, we, we certainly need to be mindful of compliance issues here, but I think we also need to be um, uh, clear that we're doing this for a much broader and um, deeper set of reasons than simply uh, to check off some uh, boxes on, um, uh, on somebody's form. It's also interesting to see how some of these uh, challenges of dealing in this new world are um, pushing various other implementation efforts and um, uh, challenges. I already spoke about interrepository propagation, and that's that's an important thing that we've known we've needed for years. There's been some good work done on that, um, uh, particularly the uh, open. Um, archives, uh, uh, repository, um, uh, reuse and exchange efforts, um, uh, but there's plenty more to do. Um, versioning of articles and how we talk about versioning through the scholarly life cycle is clearly an issue that's growing in importance and is very messy, unfortunately, uh, but um, I think there's there's no question that we're going to have to take it on, and I'm or I'm hearing lots of work underway to address this in various contexts. Um, it is striking as I speak to people how much uptake there is now on orchids. Um, it seems fairly clear that these are likely to be the dominant. Um, author ID, at least for scholarly workflows. Um, and since they play pretty nice with ISNIs, they should, um, they, they should extend out into that, um, that uh, namespace as well. A uh, lot of institutions are starting to de develop or deploy strategies to push them out to fa uh, faculty on a systematic basis. I guess I would make a plea that um, you don't stop at faculty. Uh, the high pay, there's a really high payoff, I think, in um, getting these out to graduate students early in their um, uh, early in their post -gra in their graduate uh, career, um, and uh, having having those there. Uh, it's uh, I, I think a very powerful strategy to look to reach out past um, actual faculty. There are some other identifiers that are, you know, lurking in the wings um, that we know we need, that we're collectively kind of looking at and figuring out how to engage. Fundref and the whole work on identifying funders and funding programs is clearly going to be essential to coping in this environment. And then there's another one that um, makes everybody's head hurt, um, and uh, that's organizational IDs. They're, these are hard, and um, they're hard for a lot of reasons. They're hard not just because of the technical issues, but because they come with a whole pile of sort of legalistic baggage, like who defines the substructure of an organization? And um, uh, what are legitimate departments within a university or centers or labs? Uh, how do these change over time? Who maintains these sort of um, identifiers that almost imply a org chart with history? And how do we tackle the historic elements of, of organizational evolution? Now, these are not you know, unknown problems. I mean, these are problems that show up in authority control. They are issues that show up in archives. Um, there are people at organizations like the National Archives and Records um, Agency, which, uh, um, you know, have to deal with this because they're managing records that are attached to an ever-evolving structure of, um, of agencies. Uh, Yet, we, we can also see these fascinating connections between these identifiers for individuals and organizations and the way they're updated and the sort of world of linked data 
and of kind of omnipresent factual biography uh, and of being able to represent um, currently active scholars, but also the work of historical figures. Um, there's a very interesting project that's starting to uh, deploy out of uh, NARA that um, had its roots in work that Dan Pitty and others did, um, looking at archival name authorities and how to build those up. I think that um, these are gonna these are gonna create a very interesting kind of an environment where we have these these sort of diffuse analogs of older you know biographical dictionaries and things like this, and we can see you know some of the effects of this rolling out with Wikipedia, for example, um, which has you know. Uh, more biographies in it certainly than any biographical dictionary that I've ever um, heard of. Uh, um, the numbers I've seen are well over a million biographical entries in Wikipedia, in English Wikipedia at this point. Um, that's a lot of biographical entries. And um, you know, one of the things that uh, you may or may not be aware of is that there's this whole sort of quiet movement that's intertwining structured data with the textual entries in Wikipedia. Um, uh, so all of this biography in there kind of begins to connect to these um, these name authority collections that are being developed. Um, there's an interesting piece of policy attached to Wikipedia, which you may or may not have uh, ever looked at. Um, and that is a, um, a, a set of editorial guidelines about notability. Uh, put another way, who gets to have a biography in Wikipedia? Um, how's that for a contentious issue? Um, now, I think that we're clearly moving into a world where everybody gets at least a short factual biography who wants one. I mean, that's sort of what happens when you populate your ORCID profile. So I predict we are going to get into a set of very interesting challenges here about who gets to have biographies and where they go and who gets to update them and who gets to decide they don't have them. Um, these tie into issues about the right not to just to be forgotten but to be known and remembered. And I think that um, uh, we can expect some really hard um, uh, issues showing up there as we go down this path, but it seems to be an inevitable outcome of a lot of the um, thinking about identity and the sharing of scholarly activity and other kinds of activities and um, uh, the, the sort of linked data approaches, um, and he, here I'm, I'm speaking very kind of broadly about the notion of interlinking data in various places and not, I don't want to bicker about RDF re representations or something. Um, I'm, I'm speaking on a sort of a conceptual level here. The, the, the specific details of, of linked data, as all of you who've worked with it know, are a seemingly eternally moving target. Um, so perhaps that's a good place for me to move over and talk just a little bit about some of the issues that are going on in security and privacy as we look at this landscape. And this is a, this is a world that is getting unbelievably strange. And I think it's getting strange in ways that um, some of us haven't really had an opportunity to step back a little bit and consider. Um, let me just give you a few examples and, and data points here. So we seem, once upon a time, you, um, for those of you who studied computer science or cryptography, you know, you had these very simple sort of threat models where you had Alice and Bob and then eavesdroppers and people trying to mess up the conversation between Alice and Bob. And occasionally you'd also have Alice trying to talk to Charlie 
um, and you'd worry about Charlie and Bob conspiring in various ways. Um, it, was a it was a pretty constrained set of threat models. Um, the Internet Engineering Task Force earlier this year, um, which has um, really in some ways become I would say almost traumatized by the Snowden revelations and really has, has launched a sort of a major effort to, um, to reassess and revisit security and privacy in the internet environment. Um, they actually issued quite a remarkable document um, about new threat models in the internet. And they actually identified threat models that included sort of pervasive monitoring. For example, if you could watch all the traffic that's going in and out, right, even if you couldn't see into the traffic, you can do a variety of inferential things about um, who's talking to who, uh, which fall very much outside of these kind of um, uh, classic computer science threat models. Uh, it's it's really kind of remarkable to me to see the um, you know the the kind of foundational ideas here being um, readjusted for um, a very new kind of environment. And then you have other weirdnesses going on. Um, all of a sudden, quantum computing is very much in the news, and. Um, you have people um, talking about maybe practical quantum computing isn't as far away as it ought to be. Um, one of the things that um, you know is just a little side effect of that is that if you can actually get quantum computing to work, it messes up a good deal of the cryptography that underlies the uh, network. And so there are now programs underway, both in the States and in Europe, to look at um, uh, essentially um, what kind of new cryptography do we need if and when quantum computing works. And one actually hears tell of um, people collecting up um, encrypted traffic now that they can't read because they figure they'll be able to read it someday. Very interesting um, uh, kind of approach to things, um, and one that's that's quite different, I think, in in many ways than what we're used to. Another thing we've seen is just systematic security failures. Um, you know, just just scan the headlines over the last year or two. Um, look at the marvelous job that the uh, Office of Personnel Management at the U.S. government did. Um, look at what happened with Sony. Um, look at the numerous uh, corporate um, uh, um, events um, uh, where they've had data breaches. Um, look at our universities. And... It just seems to go on and on and on. Um, uh, at this point, you have to start asking some questions about, you know, can what can, how can we really keep things secure over time? Uh, probably not on the scale we'd like to. And once you start crossing that line, you have to start thinking about, you know, resiliency and um, uh, contingency and um, what's really important here and where to focus efforts. And I, I think a lot of the um, a lot of the thinking about security and privacy is going to end up reorienting that way. Let me just um, uh, note another phenomenon here that is just um, uh, fascinating to me, um, just briefly. So, used to be that most data breaches were either criminal in intent, people were trying to steal credit card numbers or um, money or, you know, um, siphon off accounts, identity theft, this kind of business. Or they were espionage-like in character, maybe industrial espionage, but taking secrets. So um, now what you have is you have these breaches um, where material is purloined and then made public. And it's often 
not entirely clear why, what the motivations were of the people who do it. Um, it's clear that at least in some cases, um, this has a very large impact on international po um, politics, in diplomacy, in public policy. Um, think of, again, the Snowden data breaches, for example. Um, uh, very clear that that material is going to be consulted for a long time by a lot of people um, uh, as evidence in, in various discussions. Um, think about the Sony data breach. It's really not clear, though, that the material that's being put out there publicly by these um, folks who cause these data breaches um, is complete or unenhanced. Um, it's really often very hard to tell what you've got there. Uh, one of the most amazing stories for those who like to um, follow this sort of thing was the Ashley Madison data breach. Um, I see a few people nodding about that. So um, Ashley Madison was a company that actually was just getting ready to go public at a significant price um, uh, that um, ran ad campaigns essentially um, uh, depicting themselves as an online affair arranging service. And um, somebody basically pulled the database off of this, all the profiles, and um, put it out on the internet. And um, all kinds of interesting issues ensued. Um, so remarkably, the first thing you got to understand, this database, and I'm going from memory here, about 35, 37 million people in it. Astounding. Um, <laughs> now, not clear it's a real high quality database because you can sign up for it, um, uh, apparently just by putting in an email and there's no handshake, so maybe it's your email, maybe it's somebody else's email, maybe you just thought it was fun to sign some other people up for it in case there was a data breach later. Um, <laughs> So people start analyzing this thing, of course, and uh, they notice, well, gee, we got a lot of um, members of parliament in here, uh, got a lot of gov addresses, all, all kinds of good stuff. Nobody knows, of course, whether any of those are legitimate ones or not. Um, so, and who knows? Who knows if the people who um, pulled the database added a few just because it was fun, or took out a few addresses before making it public. We'll never know, probably. Um, other people have been analyzing this, this um, file in other ways since, by the way, and um, there's now a sort of a small statistical industry uh, in um, writing papers about um, anomalies in here. It appears, for example, that while something like 10 or 11 million um, entries were coded female, that um, almost all of them were um, computationally generated and imaginary. Um, there were really like 10 million imaginary entries in there. Um, interesting uh, as an insight into something, but uh, uh, I just leave it there. The question I would ask though, without putting too fine a point on it, is um, there is a long history of purloined documents of various kinds, changing public policy, changing history, having big impacts on society, and being very, very legitimate and important ongoing evidentiary material for the kind of scholarly work that people in our institutions do. Think back to some to things like the Pentagon Papers, for example. We're now in an age where we don't publish these things. They live online. And I think you can ask some very um, confusing questions about who should be looking after these, when and if archival commitments should be made to maintain these, how we attempt to validate and understand the quality or accuracy of these kinds of things. 
I don't think it's good enough to just say, oh, this is messy, you know, it's, these, this is purloined data, um, we'll just wish it goes away. Um, I, think, I think we're in a world now where it's not gonna go away and we need, again, to think through a, um, a nuanced response as a part of this whole rethinking of the security and privacy landscape. I need to keep moving though. Um, there's so many things to talk about. I'll say one more set of things about the privacy area. Um, as I think many of you know, um, CNI has gotten quite interested in privacy, especially as it interacts with things like the widespread and somewhat profligate use of analytics of various sorts. Um, that uh, user tracking in various contexts, and I think we'll hear a little bit about that at the closing plenary, has moved to you know, levels that are really hard to imagine. Um, we're building all kinds of potentially creepy things ranging from um, uh, you know, e-textbooks that tattle on you all the way through um, uh, companions for children and the elderly that you can talk to. Um, that to send your voice out up on the internet so that it can be processed, so that your you know, talking Barbie or whatever can um, say the right things back to you and maybe tell your, um, tell your parents what um, you've been saying to your doll or um, whatever. Um, we're, we're into a, a, a level of things that listen and collect data that is, is really almost unprecedented. And I think there are a couple of places where, you know, this falls pretty squarely into areas that um, we ought to be considering here. Uh, the whole question of reading analytics, I think, is a very real one, for example. Um, CNI held a small workshop, um, which I'm still trying to uh, get the write-up done for um, this spring, which looked at a few of the privacy and security issues. And one of the one of the things that we came out of um, that meeting with as a as a very strong consensus, and I'll, I'll just say this in a kind of a general and equivocated way, is that. People should have an expectation of reasonable privacy in their interactions with various kinds of networked information resources. And in cases where that can't be met, they should be at least informed that you know, their expectations are not being met and data is being collected. And um, it was fairly clear that you know, we've been generally doing a reasonably horrible job of this, um, ranging from, you know, real no-brainer kinds of things like um, opening up uh, connections to eavesdropping by default by not using um, uh, secure HTTP. And you might think, well, gee, you know, um, uh, is he gonna get his tinfoil hat out next? Um, uh, you know, how much threat is there really in, in tracking this stuff? Are we, have we got spies crawling around, um, uh, you know, listening in on, um, on people's interactions with um, Science Direct or the local online catalog or something? Well, you know, actually, given how pervasive wireless is for the last mile, um, this is no longer, you know, the world of, um, of spies and wiretappers and things like this. It's so easy to collect this stuff up off of unencrypted Wi-Fi um, that uh, um, these, uh, you really are holding these conversations in public um, if, if you're not encrypting them end to end. But at least as serious as the technical stuff is the need for... Um, a um, hard look at some of the contractual provisions about um, uh, data reuse and collection by some of the um, some of the information providers that our libraries and our institutions contract with. 
And I think there needs to be um, a fairly careful look at that. Uh, NISO, with some funding from the Mellon Foundation, has um, carried forward some parts of this conversation um, uh, throughout the year and just um, the other day, uh, literally. Um, I believe put out the final version of its effort at um, distilling some principles that are relevant and, and perhaps a helpful start here. Uh, but it's, um, it's really clear, I think, that we have some homework to do in this area uh, and that um, there's also a reasonable amount of confusion. Um, in, in conducting these conversations, for instance, I found widely differing um, opinions about exactly what the state was of authentication and authorization handoffs between um, uh, institutions like universities that do site licenses and content providers like journal publishers or database providers. Um, so we're going to actually go out and collect a little data on that, and you will be hearing from us um, uh, with a couple of questions on that uh, sometime in early 2016. Uh, there seems to be enough disagreement about what the facts are that maybe it's time to get some, so uh, we will be moving ahead on that. Um, I just want to say a few more things now about... Um, scale and about innovation. I, I get very confused when I look at the landscape now. We see a lot of striking innovations showing up in areas where information technology is getting combined with other things you know, drones, autonomous vehicles, um, various kinds of machine learning driven things. Um, uh, um, robotics of various kinds, uh, the personal companions I was talking about a minute ago, those kinds of things. But in terms of kind of direct technical innovation, I can't point to um, a lot of things I've seen in the last year that are like, this is really new and it's a game changer. Um, Maybe some of you have different opinions about that. But I actually feel like a lot of the kind of core um, information technology that we've been relying on um, is now in a mode where it's doing a lot of aggressive forced obsolescence. Um, it's generating a lot of churn. It's costing a lot of investment in individual and institutional time to stay current, but with often rather limited payoffs in terms of what you get for doing all that work. Um, we'll see whether that continues. Um, I think it's fairly clear that um, if it does, we're going to need to start struggling with how to um, slow down the hamster wheel uh, because um, just running really hard and burning a lot of resources to stay in place um, is not where we need to be. I do see huge progress, though, on the scale side. Um, we are starting, I think, as a community, haltingly and painfully to think about operating at scale and um, about hard issues of genuine interoperability, um, trying to consciously and um, thoughtfully reduce redundancy when it's not useful for some reason. Um, I'm very encouraged by some of these developments like the International Image Interoperability Framework. Um, that, uh, it was striking to me in looking at the submissions uh, for breakouts at this meeting, not just the ones we accepted, but the ones we didn't have room for at how many things now we're employing or building on that um, to interoperate across collections and pull down silos. Um, I think that, you know, again, we're seeing people think about how do we interconnect A and B as opposed to having a silo, and we need a lot more of those conversations. 
I want to conclude just briefly with a few conversations about where we are on preservation and stewardship. And I think when we look at, you know, the sort of um, fundamental technologies of preservation, um, there is good progress happening here. Um, there is progress happening on everything from the managing the ingest side um, all the way through um, uh, trying to get emulation kind of environments to the point where um, they are a genuine, um, uh, reliable, production-worthy kind of tool in the, um, in the world of, of preserving materials. Uh, I had an opportunity a couple months ago to preview a version of the talk that um, David Rosenthal will be giving later in this session about, I'm sorry, later in this conference about um, emulation. He um, uh, got some funding from the Andrew Mellon Foundation to take a look at this. And um, the progress when you look at these systems is really quite substantial. Um, there is still a world of headaches, but most of them as with so many things in the stewardship area, are now not primarily technical. Um, they are about licensing and intellectual property and all of this kind of wonderful stuff. Um, one of the things though that I think is um, really troublesome um, when you back off from the base technologies of preservation to the sort of broader picture of stewardship and the work of stewardship organizations is the way that um, our memory organizations are increasingly being cut out from collecting various kinds of material. Uh, this just gets a little worse every year it seems. Um, there's more music that's digital only that Organizations can't legally collect and add to their um, collections because the license agreements don't permit it. Um, there, we're seeing more and more video, um, the growth of streaming models as ways of moving around cultural materials. I think there are some genuine, um, uh, you know, positive things that are popping up. I was, um, in many ways, very encouraged to see the um, new Random Penguin uh, ebook policy. Uh, which actually, you know, really talks about um, we're not going to simulate wear and tear or have our books self-destruct. Um, these are intended to be long-term, you know, perpetual licenses, essentially. Um, and that's a really, really um, encouraging development, I think. The, I, I just wish we had more of them to point to. I also think that there's another problem that's getting increasingly clear, and it's about preservation and stewardship, but it's also about accountability. Um, and maybe I'll close with this, because this is a, a really fundamental kind of conceptual problem that I'm not sure we have got good traction on yet. So once upon a time, you used to be able to say, well, you know, if I could capture the content of a database, I would have captured, in some sense, the behavior of a system. So you might talk about um, the news, a newspaper moving from printed sheets to a database. And so you say, okay, um, as it moves, what I need to do is capture all the stuff in the database with the appropriate timestamps about when it went into the database and when it was modified. And I'd have a pretty good sense of what's going on. Well, if you look at the digital newspapers such as they were of 10 years ago, that's probably true. But now, you have an algorithm interposed between you and that database that is very complicated. Um, it's not just a pull out these three things that are the headlines and then um, uh, you know um, everything else. 
it's, it looks at who it thinks you are, what your history is with the site, where it thinks you are geographically. Um, it looks at a whole pile of things. So you essentially are getting a personalized experience with most of your interactions with the web now to a greater or lesser extent. And you are getting that personalized experience mediated through an algorithm that is hugely complicated and that in some cases is getting to the point where nobody really understands it or understands how to document it or the changes in it. And they're actually doing A-B testing to kind of tweak the algorithm um, and find out what the tweak does uh, because the effects of tweaking the algorithm are very unpredictable. We have no idea how to document the evolution of these kinds of complex network-based mediating algorithms. And um, this is a preservation problem, to be absolutely sure, a stewardship problem. But it's also an accountability problem, given how many things now are using these kinds of algorithms to identify you for attention of various kinds, establish a credit rating for you, um, uh, decide whether you're, um, you know, at risk for dropping out of school, uh, you name your favorite thing. Um, these algorithms do a lot more than show you what they think you believe is the news that you would be interested in. Um, and uh, I think we're going to need to think really hard about how to come to terms with this kind of an environment where algorithms and algorithms that most importantly are both complex and dynamically changing um, personalize experience. Uh, I don't know what the answers are here, um, but it is absolutely clear to me that as we look at documenting um, the digital experience, um, uh, interacting with various kinds of content resources going forward, that this is going to become a more and more significant um, practical rather than simply theoretical conundrum. We'll continue, of course, to um, push on that kind of an issue. So I hope I've given you a little tour here of some of the curiosities and developments that are fascinating me over the past year and some of the issues that I'm taking away from them um, uh, that we need to be thinking about on our agenda. Um, there are certainly plenty of them and as I say I think we are in a time where there's, um, there's a lot of transition taking place and where in some cases we're being challenged to, if not change our direction, um, at least change our approaches or um, uh, revise our strategy in response to unexpected uh, um, forces that are, are reshaping the, um, the directions we're going forward on, whether they're funder mandates or um, uh, real genuine changes in our ability to um, be capable of securing digital information at scale. I would be very pleased to take a few minutes to answer questions about the program plan, um, what I think is going on in the world, um, things that we should or shouldn't be doing, um, or anything else. So I thank you for uh, spending some time with me, and the floor is open. Thanks. Oh, come on, we must have some takers. Here comes somebody. Good afternoon, Joyce Ogburn, Appalachian State University. I think you're spot on, Cliff, in thinking about algorithmic mediation or whatever words we want to use. I'm working on a chapter for something right now where I touch on that, but I think how machines are now 
writing without us knowing whether they're, it's a machine or a person writing and whose authority and, and uh, accountability, all those things are all bound up together. And I think it's a worthy subject for us to all look into because it affects scholarship and people all over the world too in various ways. Thanks. Yeah, there, this phenomenon of machine authoring is, is something else that these algorithms are doing. Um, I don't know if you know, but a good, goodly number of the sports reports, for example, the small time stuff, you know, like high school football games, um, is actually being written by machine now. Um, you just, you feed it a couple of data points and it spews out a little article um, uh, suitable for the wire services. Um, I think they're also starting to do this now with um, uh, things like quarterly reports from uh, corporations from time to time. So uh, it's getting to be an interesting world out there. David. Uh, hi, David Rosenthal from Stanford. Um, so I, I want to go back to your point about who's responsible for custody of um, leaked information. This is a um, problem that we've encountered at Stanford. Uh, Stanford lawyers impo impounded a librarian's hard drive because it had WikiLeaks on it. And I believe that the reason was that um, that's classified material and Stanford does classified research and it cannot have uh, classified information outside um, uh, government approved uh, areas. Um, and I think that this, is a, this isn't just a problem about classified information. I think people's lawyers will be nervous about information like the Ashley Madison database and so on for uh, liability reasons and so on. So uh, I think this is an area that needs looking at. It is, and it's, it's very complicated. I mean, I have heard similar um, uh, stories about um, material being pulled. Um, the Snowden material seems to be a particularly good case in point here because um, lots of people uh, refer to it or might show a slide from it as part of a discussion about security practices or eavesdropping practices. And um, apparently all it takes is, you know, one of these slides in a video of a guest lecture someplace to all of a sudden cause um, um, hysteria and the guest lecture to be removed in some cases. Uh, um, it's, it's very, it is very problematic and it's, uh, it, it's something that w the labels we put on things make a big difference. Um, for example, a number of our, our great research institutions have in recent years built up collections of human rights violation evidence. Um, uh, they've made that an important institutional priority. And you know, when you frame it like that, it sounds like um, it's much better, but in fact, depending on who you ask, those materials are very controversial and certainly have been subject to ongoing attack from many sources. Uh, so I think there's really quite a nuanced discussion to be had here. But it, it does seem like this, a lot of this is material that research libraries should be providing to scholars, but it may be very difficult for them to do so. Yeah, and maybe, the, maybe some of the solutions here are, are international ones as well as national ones. Um, but uh, you know, this this is a problem that's that's nasty, but I don't think it's going to go away. It's going to get considerably um, more complex, I fear. Other questions, comments? Oh, Peter. Uh, Peter Burnhill, University of Edinburgh. Um, I'd be interested in the extent to which you think that the concept of published heritage is useful or not, because one could have thought that libraries in one day used to spend their time with well-published material, which they then organized and made available, and then there was that grey literature stuff, which was somewhere else. But the idea of that which was not published, in some sense, was not principally its concern, except in special collections and therefore you sort of get towards the archival side. But now clearly 
so many things are made public through the web one way or another, mm -hmm. some very deliberately by the author or publisher or those that had rights to make it available, uh, but just sticking with that rather than the inadvertent, so to speak, um, wh where is the role, if you like, of the research library vis-a-vis -vis the published heritage, or has that concept now disappeared because nothing is really well published these days, or at least so many things are variably published? So, so um, I need to fess up that the, I'm not hearing the term published heritage for the first time. Um, Peter and his colleagues um, at Adena and uh, the University of Edinburgh put on just an amazing uh, small conference and workshop in September that, among other things, looked at some of these issues. And um, uh, there's a report from it that I, um, I strongly commend to your attention. Um, I think this is, this, is, this is a wonderful and absolutely core question. And um, you, you can work on it from two directions. You can ask, what does it mean to be published in the digital age? Or you can work at it. Uh, you you can work it from the point of view that um, you know thinking about published is no longer useful, and um, we need to think about much more about sort of holistic um, uh, social outputs, cultural outputs, um, uh, bro very very broadly defined. And there's probably some merit in um, in in both of those. Um, uh, you know, published has always brought along at least some baggage of favoring things that, that work inside an economic sphere. And certainly there are um, enormous amounts of, of cultural production that, that don't fit in there. And in some senses, the internet has really enabled some of those things to thrive. On the other hand, um, uh, the notion of published as in made public and that using that as a um, you know as, as a selection line um, maybe is a, is a, is still a really fruitful idea so I, I find that phrase um, really really resonant and and one that um, that deserves a lot of thought and scrutiny um, and I, I appreciate you bringing it forward okay cheers One more? I think people are ready for a little break. Thanks so much, and let me wish you a wonderful conference. <laughs>